Good afternoon, and thank you for everybody that's staying, um, ha that has stayed. Um, today I'm going to talk about alliances and um, my research and the importance of research, especially um, when we're designing and, and implementing um, um, and building, creating, whether it's relationships or homes or communities, the importance of that. Uh, the paper that I'm going to present today is based on partnerships of people working together, seeking to understand the form and function of alliances and community-based research from a Haudenosaunee's perspective between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. As some of you may recognize, let's see if I can... Oops. Um, whoops. As some of you may recognize this idea of form and function from an agricultural pers uh, perspective, or archaeological, or not archaeological, yeah, agrotextual agri perspective, it stems from Lewis Sullivan's idea or notion of form and function, who, um, and Lewis Sullivan was a mentor to Frank Lloyd Wright. Mr. Wright went on to describe environmental um, integrated approach to architects as in, um, organic architecture. A quote by, by uh, Frank Lloyd Wright where he says, form follows function has been mis and that it has been misunderstood. Form and function should be one, joined in a spiritual union. The same is true in whatever work that we do on this earth. The notion actually goes back to Haudenosaunee creation story. However, I'm going to speak in terms of the Digni de Yohage Gaswantage and alliances and how the form and function of working together is essential, whether building a house or designing a community in the building. The being and doing is part of how we come to know. So on, on the slide we have uh, the two row and, and building partnerships. This is actually a group um, between, um, well, the, the wampum is actually um, from um, the 1613 and it was uh, one of the first treaties between the Haudenosaunee people and early settlers. First the Dutch and later the French and English undertook um, this idea and this, this partnership within the treaty and what it meant. The Haudenosaunee recognized with, with respect to the, the differences in lifestyles, beliefs, and values between themselves and early settlers therefore wanting to maintain the cultural tenets of peace, friendship, um, as defined throughout the cultural philosophy of the great law. This wampum belt expresses an agreement and a responsibility between the Haudenosaunee and the new settlers and settlers today in a peaceful and respectful coexistence between the culture, two cultures in North America. The three main philosophical concepts of Haudenosaunee teachings is the good mind and equal justice, strength through unity and peace. The work um, that I started um, started with um, this two row partnership building um, group between McMaster University um, and my community of Six Nations um, with the Deohahage at Six Nations Polytechnic. Um, the Indigenous Knowledge Center. And this partnership, we, we gathered together, and we've been in existence for the past probably four, almost five years now. And it, it's in, um, Indigenous community people and elders um, or knowledge holders um, from the uh, Six Nations community, as well as scholars and, and faculty and students from McMaster University, Indigenous and non-Indigenous. And during these meetings, the group discusses this, these philosophical concepts of the two-row wampum, or the Digni Deohage Gaswantage, as well as the covenant chain 
of friendship and the Haudenosaunee great law and what, what we bring each to each other during um, these meetings. Um, we developed their relationship and got to know each other first, which was really important. And then we shared our, our ideas in regards to the topics um, and the needs of both um, the community and the academy to, to determine where our um, ideas and needs intersected. As well, we agreed on a research agenda um, and that would respect both partners and this is still in progress, so we talk about that. So you can see in the, this diagram how um, our students, our scholars, our agencies are on one side, indigenous people and community um, members and agencies are in, on another. And they say um, from the knowledge keepers that, we're, um, that there's the ship, which is the academy, and the canoe, which is represented um, in metaphor as um, for the indigenous community and we travel down this river of life and in this um, river of life and in, in our two vessels um, we, we respect each other um, through this friendship and um, try to work together. During um, the two row partnership group we also build partnerships. And this is really important when you want to work with an indigenous community, whether it's um, Six Nations or other indigenous communities, to understand the relationship. And what does that relationship mean? What does it mean to go into an indigenous community and um, um, meet the community on the, on the community's terms? It's coming to a working relation or a arrangement and understanding what that working arrangement is between both the community and the academy. It's also a challenging those assumptions um, that you may have um, while going into an indigenous community Re and redefining those expectations. And the only way that you can do that is, is actually going into that community. Um, and then between the community and the academy of, of scholars and students, it's coming to that action plan. And what is important is listening, listening to the community and coming to one mind in regards to um, going forward um, in the work that's going to happen. From a research perspective, it's important to come to agreement in principle about what's going to happen. Um, what, what are you going to research? What are you going to um, build or create within the community? Whether, whether it's an, a physical uh, building or whether it's, um, it's gathering knowledge and, and um, uh, supporting the community and, and the direction that they want to go. Um, and some research agendas, um, whether um, it's peer research, um, ethics needs to be approved in working with the community. And you may have to also go, Six Nations does has, have an ethics count, uh, committee, um, which uh, application does have to be filled out, as well as um, if you're coming from an, uh, um, a community perspective, um, that application has to be filled within the university too. Frank Lloyd Wright talks about the study, to study nature, to love nature, stay close to nature. It will now, never fail you. And that's, a, that's an important quote from Frank Lloyd Wright. I had the opportunity when I was down in Phoenix, Arizona to go visit his one um, house that he has down or down there and um, they have the um, agricultural or not agricultural architectural school um, and I um, we got to tour that and it was amazing and that was some years ago um, amazing the work and the ideas that he had in regards to implementing um, that that aspect of nature within to in the work that he he designs with the buildings and 
his homes. And I think that's really important because, um, oops, got a little ahead of myself. Because indigenous, um, in working with, from an, an indigenous paradigm, it conceptualates and integrates the notion of indigenous knowledge through the being and doing of whether it's research, consultation, or creating um, in communities, and that important importance of um, ethics. Kathy Absalon refers to this indigenous paradigm as a process of coming to how we how we come to know again, or kadasawin. In an indigenous research paradigm, it's spiritual. It's based on the connection to the land and natural environment, such as um, Frank Lloyd Wright talked about um, in regards to um, form and function. The framework of indigenous inquiry engages a holistic per perspective, drawing on the emotional, spiritual, physical, mental well-being of the people. It builds upon our relationship with the spiritual and natural world as reflected through our interaction with the natural environment and, and is, is expressed through the discourse of our languages and our cultural practices. Indigenous people move beyond the attachment of land and that our ways of knowing and consciousness is informed by the creator and shaped by the land. The knowledge we experience on the land and in the natural environment is so different from the knowledge we obtain from within the institutions of the Western Academy. For indigenous people, the land and natural environment and the animals teach us the importance of relationship, humility, and respect, that we're a small part of something really big. To know from within an indigenous perspective is to touch, feel, smell, taste and see, and to live that experience. Indigenous knowledge does not flow primarily through our intellect, but it engages all our senses and contributes to our knowing. As an indigenous paradigm incorporates a way of knowing or seeking knowledge, by turning our gaze inwards to trust our inner exploration of answers. Willie Ermine talks about indigenous epistemology. And he says that to those who seek to understand the reality of existence and harmony with the environment by turning inward, have a different incorporeal knowledge paradigm that might be termed Aboriginal epistemology or ways of knowing. The inner space that is, un that, is that universe is of being within each person is sim simultaneous with the soul, spirit, self, and, and or being. Frank Lloyd, Lloyd Wright talks about no house shall, should ever be on a hill or anything. It should be the hill belonging to it so hill and house could live together, each the happier for, for the other. And he also has this quote, space is a breath of art. So from this picture you see a, a, a traditional longhouse village. Um, longhouses are being built, a palisade is being created around um, the, the, those longhouses, the, those communities. But you also see the space between the palisades and this, this indigenous community that is, that is evolving and the woods. For Haudenosaunee people, we have um, the ceremony, which is called the Edge of the Woods Ceremony. And um, way back before settlers came, if um, visitors came to visit our, our communities, um, there would be this space, this vulnerable space between the woods 
and our, our, the Palisades, or, or where our communities existed. And it's that space, that vulnerable space, that a person, just imagine, a person or people would have to walk towards without knowing who's watching them. Um, I've been told also that at that, this edge of the woods ceremony, um, some of the, the men would be in the woods um, looking at or watching if what's, what's in the woods, what's coming. And before visitors would come into our community, as I mentioned, there would be a ceremony called Edge of the Woods Ceremony. And um, our, our men would um, inform us, um, they would light a fire and inform us that whether um, people would be coming into our, our community. And depending on, I guess, the, the type of smoke from the fire would inform us whether those people are good or bad or, or we, we should be protecting ourselves or, or welcoming those people. For me, I look at that space between the woods and the Palestine as brave space. And it's important to, as non-Indigenous people, when you're coming into an indigenous community to know that brave space, to understand that the this, this space that um, you're coming into, that indigenous people are going to be watching, watching you. We may not say a lot, but we'll be watching you and, and watching your behaviors to see if your words match your behaviors. And to see if, if that you can contribute. Um, and a lot of times, um, for indigenous people, um, that view and that understanding of who's coming into our community was important in protecting, um, um, protecting our families and protecting our ways of life. But we were also wel very welcoming people, too. Um, so that's, that's an important process in regards to coming into a, um, an indigenous space. And I think that Haudenosaunee people were very um, intelligent in regards to having the space between their communities that they built and the natural forest and the natural beings. And it coincides with what Frank Lloyd Wright talks about, that the house or the, the place of, of living becomes the hill, and the hill becomes the, the place of living, and living together, um, each are happier for the other. Now, part of my research is, is um, with the two row on the ground, and, um, and it's, it's important for, to go on the land, to understand the land, as well as the waterways, so when you're creating things um, within indigenous communities, it's important to, to go on the land, to learn la the land. And one aspect of that, that um, two-row partnership group, we're talking about um, these philosophical ideas that um, come from ancient ideas of the Haudenosaunee people in regards to the two-row wampum, the great law, um, the chain of friendship, uh, the covenant chain of friendship. And um, during one of the meetings, one of the community people said, well, why don't we put these ideas into action? And I was hearing about this canoe journey that was happening, and I thought, what a great idea. Why don't I connect with, with um, the community people that are organizing this canoe journey to see if they would um, want to put these ideas um, together um, in regards to understanding, um, well, they were putting these ideas together and understanding alliance building between indigenous and non-indigenous people, but to be part of a, a pilot project that understood this. And they agreed to be um, part of this research and part of the pilot project to start this off. So part of the pilot project um, 
when I started this um, putting research into action was um, first understanding how alliances are formed and maintained among Haudenosaunee and neighboring communities. What were the challenges? What were the recommendations? And how, how do we do that as Haudenosaunee and neighboring communities? We have what the stories from the two row that talk about that peace, um, friendship, respect, and unity. Um, but how do you do that? Another part was to do an environmental scan on the various projects that um, community people have done in trying to foster alliances, as well as understand the, the history of Haudenosaunee in relation to the Haldeman Track Treaty of 1784. Um, there have been a number of initiatives from different community people where they walk along the river or they canoe down the river or they um, have done various projects with the river and, the, and this traditional lands. Um, and the, sec the next part of this, this um, paradigm is to understand this perspective from young people. And um, we're going to, in this next year, bring together Six Nations youth and non-Indigenous youth to learn about, um, for them to learn about community history, re relationship building, um, and relationship to place, leadership skills, alliance building. And then at the end, they're going to participate in this canoe journey and, and produce digital stories from their experience. So this is my, myself and my colleague, uh, Dr. Trish Van Kedwick. Um, and I, when I had this idea, um, I, I invited Trish, who is of Dutch ancestry. I didn't know that until after we talked. Um, and I asked her to come, to leave the ship and come into the, to the metaphor canoe. And actually, we, went, we um, canoed during this uh, pilot project. And part of this pilot project um, and putting this, this action together, um, we drew from a critical uh, autoethnography perspective and exploring what indigenous, non-indigenous relationship was based from a Haudenosaunee perspective of allyship. We considered our unique experiences as they related to the structures and experiences that shape our world. Um, and we looked at the connectedness in which the researcher begins their work by positioning themselves within their research. Both myself and Trish decided to ground this exploration in the critical autoethnography of work and indigenous journey. And our journey opened up and consolidated a search that brought, out, brought us out well beyond and deeply inward. The search made it possible to uh, closely explore indigenous and non-indigenous alliances that were creating by the being and doing. We found ourselves increased, immersed in metaphors that could describe the developments of alliances and friendship through research in a way that tapped into the knowledges that we do not, that we don't just rely on textbooks. In this way, our experience and the metaphorical weight became ascetic. We encountered, we went it, when we first encountered it into the canoe, there was an uncertainty that comes with the unfamiliar movement and balancing the rippling waves of the river's surface. We used the sides of the canoe and tried to stabilize our position. We discovered various ways in creating movement from paddling to pushing ourselves against the riverbed and rocks and branches with our paddles to lurching for our bodies forward in a rhythmic forward to loosen our canoe from the bank that it became grounded. We struggled to find a way to take the uh, distinct responsibilities of our position in the canoe while learning to respond and join our efforts when the situation called upon us. 
Midway through our first day on the river, we entered into deep waters whose current was fast and strong. We approached a, a large rock in front of us and unable to steer clear of it, our canoe capsized um, underneath the Colburn Bridge in Bramford. We worked hard to stand straight in the rushing waters um, that prevented the, that um, made the canoe sink to, uh, um, into the heavy current. The paddle, a paddle and a hat disappeared down the river. Um, and when we tried to move the canoe towards the shore, the canoe swung around and almost knocked myself over. We stood there in the middle of the river, unable to do anything but remain standing, clinging to a rock and the canoe so that it would not be swept away. Trish yelled over to me over the rushing noise of the water saying, what do we do? And I yelled back, I don't know. Actually, this was my first time in a canoe. Um, so with the help of another paddler um, and a long rope, we worked together and um, brought the, the canoe to calmer waters. Um, and we borrowed another paddle and carefully um, re-entered the canoe. We listened to the advice of a skilled paddler and uh, um, stayed away from those rocky waters. Um, from then on, Trish and I kept our, our eyes faced forward, or she kept her fa eyes faced forward, scanning the water and focusing on information that the river was willing to share with her. She decided to stop helping me um, with the steering and listening to the, and listen to the splash of my paddle. For myself, um, I began to, um, to um, um, maneuver my role in the back of the canoe. And it was um, as once we understood our roles and responsibilities in the, our canoe, we were able to maneuver and, and go forward um, in a way that, that was graceful and fluid. Um, at the start of this, this journey, it was interesting because we were way back behind at the very end of the, the row of canoes. And once we had this experience of a, of a capsizing moment um, and became fluid with our um, movements and um, started working together, um, we ended up in the front of, the, of the, um, all the canoes. So this capsize experience represents moments of alliances that almost needed to rupture in order for collaboration and intentional relationship to occur. With the inward gaze, we can see the constructions that need to be loosened in, so significant, so in a significant way as to suspend us in a place of dilemma or uncertainty. We need to relearn our space in, or, in order to establish ethics and create the potential of a two-row alliance. The river asked us to research our place in the relationship and then provide us with the knowledge that is drawn from entirely of the environment in which we are immersed in and with, um, in which we move our journey. The canoe is a space that both indigenous and non-indigenous people can enter together. However, they are not just in a canoe, they're entered into the natural elements of, of the, the surroundings of the Grand River, of the land, the banks around us, as well as those treaties and, and understanding of those historical treaties that, that um, have been put into place in terms of treaty relationships, it is, important, it is an important aspect that the canoe experiences both indigenous and non-indigenous members. We're creating a distinctiveness as identified in terms of position, responsibilities, and roles um, within the canoe, as well as allies defined by treaties. By sharing this canoe and river experience, 
Our distinctiveness is not transformed so that we become one person of the canoe, but rather the canoe becomes transformed, merging with the river to become an ethical space. And if you think of that in terms of, I want to say agriculture, you're not agricultural, you're um, um, in terms of architecture and the importance of immersing architectural um, buildings and, and um, 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 forms with the environment, you come to, there's an, there's an allyship within that, that you can um, understand this, this space becomes an ethical space. Um, Willie Ermey writes, the differences that uh, consolidate ethical space is, um, and it, he's quoted in saying, these are the differences that highlight the uniqueness because each entity is molded from a distinct history knowledge, tradition, philosophy, and social and political reality. With a calculated disconnection through the con contrasting of their identities and the subsequent creation of two solitudes with each claiming their own distinct and autonomous view of the world, a theoretical space between them is opened. And that's what F Frank Lloyd writes is talking about when he created and designed many spaces in relation to that organic environmental architecture. Somehow our cog cognitive knowledge of the two-row wampum and our existence thinking between each, what each of us were bringing into the canoe did ally feelings of, of anxiety, anxiety. The challenge of, of um, many projects, or with many projects, is to explore how our knowledge could be expanded and deepened with the being and doing that this journey or any journey is called upon. This knowledge extends to beneath the water, beyond the banks, and high into the sky. The being and doing of this journey or any project has deepening our knowledge through a mindfulness that opens the way to critical consciousness through the space of engagement. When we look at the two row wampum, the, there's three, three beads um, between the two ro purple rows. We begin to comprehend and understand that respect, friendship, and peace that we have with each other and with the world around us. In coming to realize our relationship as indigenous and non-indigenous allies, we shift to a level of friends and in many cases of a family relationship through a critical awareness of this consciousness. This consciousness from the land, water, is the foundation which supports and mobilize indigenous, non-indigenous peoples. And that land and water, Frank Lloyd Wright has a, a, um, um, a house in Pennsylvania, uh, the River House, that has a river that, I haven't been there yet, but I am going to go there this summer. Um, and that's how he, he melds that ethical, or creates the ethical space of the natural environment. With not agriculture, I keep on calling your discipline agricultural with architectural um, design, which, is, which I see and think is amazing. Um, this, so it's this consciousness um, of the natural environment and, and building design. Um, Vanessa Watts talks about and describes the notions, notions of consciousness as place-based thought. And she says, the non-distinctive space where place and thought have never separated because they never could or can be separated from an indigenous perspective. Place thought is based upon the premise of land and water is alive and thinking that humans and non-humans derive agency through the extensions of these thoughts, unquote. 
Therefore, consciousness transcends back to the beginning of time, and as some of my colleague speakers talked about, to creation. The thoughts of Sky Woman as she landed on the turtle's back creating Earth. While considering the water and the thoughts of the animals who were part of contributing to this consciousness and creation of the Earth. This consciousness and memory is ingrained through the land and waters in which our bodies and blood memory have been created. From a Haudenosaunee, Ongohoe perspective, we as human beings are put on this earth, understand the earth as our mother, the waters on this earth are the bloodlines of our mother, and everything is related. Having this level of consciousness creates us as humans to the history and thought of our own creation, as well as the creation and purpose of everything living, including the earth. Place-based thought is innate within us, interconnecting us with the outer world and the outer world connecting to us inside. So I just want to finish with this, um, this last quote from Peter Cole. But before that, to remind you and bring you back to circle around um, to what Frank Lloyd Wright talks about um, from your art architectural perspective, that form and function should be one, joined in a spiritual union. So Peter Cole talks about the canoe and how the, the, the natural elements that form this canoe are important. And we should think about the natural building materials that we use when we create and build things. So he says, we learn to take the canoe from the cedar without felling. Slate tools perverse with islands. Not just a way of life, but life itself. Hunting trails, berry trails, trading trails. We assemble bit by bit the canoe, giving thanks. In that place, Euro philosophy calls conceptual place. There. Here, I speak with the assembled tree nations to a particular tree, asking permission to use part of its clothing, its body, its spirit. As a vehicle for my journey of words, ideas, intentions, actions, feeling, as a companion, paddle, 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 swoosh, yeah.